Welcome to today's session of High Value Publishing. Uh, this is going to be a very fun session today. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, search engine optimization, specifically for publishers. Uh, I am really excited about this topic because it's something that a lot of publishers, we don't really focus on a lot. And there's a reason behind that. We don't focus on this a lot because our publications have typically been around for a long time. We have a lot of content. We've got this big, long tail of content we published over multiple years. Uh, but it's becoming more and more important that publishers pay attention to search engine optimization. Uh, now, I want to be very, very clear about this session. We're only going to have about a half hour together. There is no way I can cover the entire gamut of search engine optimization. I mean, this is something we could do you know, an entire uh, one day workshop on. Uh, it, it's something that um, you know some people focus on as their entire livelihood. But I want to give you the fundamentals. I want to talk through all the various elements of search engine optimization, and then we can dive into those deeper, perhaps in later sessions, or you could dive in deeper on your own with this, or you know, reach out and chat with me on this. But we're going to go dive into search engine optimization specifically for publishers today. Uh, so a few little housekeeping notes as always. This session is indeed being recorded, uh, and all of our past sessions are available if you go to highvaluepublishing.com. That just redirects to the nearviewmedia.com website, so you can go out there for that. Uh, all of the links that we're going to talk about during today's session, and there's going to be a lot of them in today's session, will be made available uh, when the recording is posted to our website. So just go to highvaluepublishing.com. You can go there. You can see past sessions and get all the links. Typically, we publish these sessions on the Thursday uh, after this session. So this Thursday, this session will go live with all the links we talk about. Uh, High Value Publishing is also available as a podcast on all the major platforms now. So go out and check it out. Apple, Google, Spotify, even on Alexa now. Um, I found out this week... <laughs> I had someone um, uh, try to pitch me on, on, on a service that they were offering and they're like, congratulations, your podcast is number 222 in the marketing podcast category of, of the United States. I'm like, woohoo, we're not 225, we're 222. So I mean, I'm excited about that. I mean, hey, we have a very niche topic here uh, and uh, we've only been going for a few weeks, but hey, we're number 222. Sounds awesome. Um, if you have any questions during this session, feel free to post them to the chat uh, here at the live session. I am watching that chat and I will uh, try to answer any of those that uh, come through. Or if you're watching this archived, uh, you can feel free to post a question. Just go to highvaluepublishing.com. There's submit a question link right there. Pop it in and I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as we can. And then finally, I just want to say thanks as always to What's New in Publishing. Really appreciate the guys over there. Um, taking these sessions, republishing them through what's new in publishing. So uh, definitely go check them out. All right, you guys ready to dive into some search engine optimization for publishers? All right, first thing we're going to start with is an acronym that I want you to uh, take to heart. It's called EAT. It stands for Expertise, Authority, and Trust. Okay, so what is EAT? What's the significance uh, of, of EAT? This is actually something that's published uh, Google actually publishes guidelines to manual content reviewers out there, and they talk a lot about this concept of EAT, Expertise, Authority, and Trust. When they're evaluating uh, sites to see um, you know, how well the algorithms are ranking them, let me be clear. Uh, Google does not necessarily use manual reviewers to say this site should rank higher than that site. That's not the issue here. But Google does get manual reviewers out there who are checking to see how are Google algorithms doing? How are they um, doing at um, evaluating the content? And there's some, a whole set of guidelines out there. So let me actually take you to the guidelines here. This is it. Uh, I'll put this link into uh, the recording when we have that posted on the site. Uh, but it's a 172 page document uh, of guidelines for about the search quality rating and, and how uh, it should be done. Uh, one of the main things that came out here was this concept of expertise, authoritative and trustworthiness. So expertise, authority, trustworthiness. Uh, hang on, I think I just lost my video.
There we go. <laughs> um, but this expertise, authority, and trustworthiness, it's really, really important. And so what they're going to look at here is they're going to look at, okay, the person who's creating the content or the entity that's creating the content, um, what is their level of expertise that they have in this particular area? So for instance, if it's a medical article, they're going to trust a doctor or something like the Mayo Clinic more than they're going to trust, um, you know, some blogger somewhere who doesn't have any expertise. The authoritativeness of the creator, the, um, the, the website of it, of it itself. So it's not just the creator, but it's the authoritativeness of the website, of the author. And then the trustworthiness of the creator uh, and, and it's, and the website. And so we'll talk about some of these things that, that, um, that dive into eat and how eat can apply to you as a publisher in your particular area. So it's interesting as, as publishers, um, we may have real strong expertise ourselves as the experts in an area, or we may be like a news organization or something else. We have a general authority and trust about us, but we're not necessarily the experts ourselves, right? We're bringing in third-party experts to talk about that. So it's interesting as a um, as a content creator, as a publisher, what do we need to do? How do we establish this eat? So I've got a few little guidelines that could help you at improving the eat, the uh, the, the expertise, authority, and trust of your website. So number one. Uh, clean up thin or junk content. Uh, this is a big one. I cannot emphasize this. Uh, thin content, and there's probably things that are like under 600 words. That's just a guideline. Don't use that as, a, as, as an authority. But I see a lot of publishers still putting up really thin content, like a paragraph or something, or they're just reproducing something that Associated Press put out or a little press release that someone came out. Thin or junk content can really hurt your expertise, authority, and trust. It can actually reduce your search engine ranking. I would rather see publishers produce less content with more quality than more content and be it just junk. Okay, so clean up your thin, your junk content, start to phase it out from your editorial structure and just get rid of it off of your site overall. Uh, probably not getting much uh, search uh, visibility on it anyway. Um, mentions of your brand on Wikipedia or other authoritative sites. Yeah, there are actually some media companies out there or even some publishing brands who actually have an entire Wikipedia page about them, or they are mentioned in Wikipedia. This is a great way to establish you know, your particular expertise and authority that you have on a, on a topic. Um, it's not always easy to do that. There are a lot of stringent standards to get there. So I'm not saying go out, quick, create a Wikipedia page for your brand. Now, if you have a storied brand, um, maybe it's worthwhile. But are you being, you know, are, are there other authoritative sites that are out there? Are you winning awards in your area? Um, you know, anywhere that you can do to, to, to get authoritative sites to talk about you or to mention you is going to help improve your own authority. Yeah, I know it sounds weird. It's like, um, you know, if I'm working with like a regional business news publisher and um, they're like, well, we are the ones reporting on everybody and no one really reports on us. You know, what are things you can do that you can start getting yourselves more in the news where large news sites or things like that can, can start doing that. Um, one of the ways to uh, also improve your eat is to not overuse ads. Don't go nuts with the ads. Um, I highly recommend all publishers conform to what's called the better ads standards. I don't want to go too deep in that today, but I do want to point this out here. There is this whole thing called the better ad standards from the coalition of better ads. Google has bought into this wholeheartedly. Uh, and there's all different kinds of what they consider to be bad ad experiences on both desktop and on mobile. Again, I won't go too deep into it, but things like pop-up ads, auto-playing video ads, um, prestigial ads with countdown. Now you can do those if you do them the right way. Um, but they're talking about all these different kinds of, of, of ad experiences that are considered bad user experience. Well, Google doesn't like those. Google doesn't like a bad user experience. It's not because they're trying to stop you from doing ads. It's because frankly, in their search results, they want to return content 
that and, and a website experience that is positive for the people that they're serving, their searchers. Um, so I won't go deep into this. Um, we may talk about better ad standards at a different time, uh, but just keep in mind that if you're overdoing it with the ads, this can also um, uh, significantly impact your um, uh, expertise and authority. Um, authors, get authors in who are recognized authorities in your area, right? So if you're, let's say you're a regional parenting magazine and you want to talk about, um, uh, you know, kids eating disorders, get a pediatric dietitian who's well known out there, who has lots of online references and people talking about them, Put, make them the author, get them to be the author rather than one of your editors. Um, if you're, uh, you know, talking about uh, something in a particular hobby field, right? Get, get, the, get the most well-known knitter out there to talk about, you know, uh, the different kinds of knitting patterns on, on your site, right? Get, authors who are recognized authorities with lots of online references. Now, some of your authors may be that, and that's fine. That's fine. But it, it also helps if you can bring in those third parties to help with this. And to this, this is one of the most neglected pages I see on publishers' website. It's author pages, right? So, hey, we'll put up content. We may tag the content as by this author, but when you go to the actual author page, especially if you're using WordPress, it's typically linked to a page about that author and then all the articles from that author. We don't put anything on there, right? We don't put bios. We don't put photos. There's no links back to their website. There's no links to social, to their social media properties. That is a big mistake because what this is doing is it's helping you establish the authority, the trust, the expertise of the authors who are contributing that piece of content to your site. So leverage that, link out to their main website, link out to their social media properties, right? Have a good bio, have an updated photo, T pay attention to those things because that ultimately improves the expertise, authority, and trust of your own website. So this is one of the one of the things that most publishers, you look at your author pages, they're not very good. And this is a great way to help improve your expertise, authority, and trust. Uh, improve your publications about page, right? Talk about the background of the publication. How long have you been here? What's your mission? What are you doing? What's the experience you have? Why are you qualified to write about this stuff? What awards have you won? Have a great staff page. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a couple of great staff pages out there I've seen that are just really beefy and, you know, the more you can do about the about who you are and why you're trustworthy, the better it's going to be. Now, are any one of these things going to like knock you from, you know, you're going to double your search engine traffic overnight? No. But as we get into this search engine optimization, I want you to realize that, yeah, there may be a couple of things that are blocking you that we need to fix. But more than likely, it's a lot of little things, right? I, I always use the analogy of, okay, one snowflake, no big deal. But you get a million of these suckers together and you got a blizzard on your hands. Same thing. Um, one of these little pieces, it's not going to necessarily make a difference. But you start fixing all these little things we're going to talk about today, and it adds up. It, it multiplies and improves your search engine ranking. So fix that. Schema data. We're going to dive a little bit here into schema data. This is kind of, this also improves your expertise, authority, and trust. Um, this also, though, kind of factors into the technical side of things. Um, but the more you can do with your schema data, the more you're telling the search engines what your content is about and that they can better trust it. What is schema data? Let me dive a little bit into schema data here, um, kind of bridging into the technical SEO part. I'm going to talk a little bit about schema data. So I'm going to use this particular um, article here, right? So here's uh, an article, oysters poached in white wine. Uh, this is a recipe, right? Piece of content on a, on a site um, by an author there, ability to share. Here we go. And it's a cool, it's really kind of well done. He's got this great little... Um, you can even adjust the servings here and it, and it, and it uh, adjusts the ingredients. So it's, it's really good, but it's got all this stuff in here. Uh, the ingredients, the directions, some notes, right? All this information's in here, overall description of the thing. This is great. But underlying this content 
is what's called schema data. Schema data is markup on the page behind the scenes that tells Google and other search engines what is on this page. So I ran a little test. It's a great tool out there for schema.org. That's a schema markup validator. And when I ran this page through it, you will notice there's two unique air, um, items of schema data on this particular page here. One is an article. This is an article. All right, so this is an article. Um, uh, public access, it's off right now because actually this is a staging site. Uh, it's gonna go live here in a couple of weeks, but I wanted to show you this because it's a great example. Um, but you can see, hey, this, this is an article that was posted. Here was the name, here's the headline, um, here is the description, and uh, it's built underneath an expandable paywall. Okay, fine. Uh, but then also, uh, underneath the article, here's the other article information. Here is the data was published, the data is modified. Here was the author, here's the author's name. Here's the author's URL, right? This is back to the author page we talked about, right? So this article page is saying, hey, this is not just a web page, this is an article. Oh, and it's related to this author at this web page. What's the main entity? Well, it is a web page. Who's the publisher? Well, here's the publisher information. It's an organization called New Orleans Magazine. Here's the New Orleans Magazine. Uh, uh, here's the publisher's uh, logo. Here's the image uh, for, this, for this specific uh, article, right? So all this information is here. But then there's even deeper, there's a recipe. So there's actually recipe schema data out there that tells Google others, this is a recipe. Um, so. What's the type, an image, description, keywords, date published, prep time, cook time, total time, the category, the cuisine, the yield, the ingredients, who did it, the instructions, right? All this data is behind the scenes of this one little article. That's schema data. The more we can tell the search engines, not just, hey, here's a page of content, here's a web page, but this is what this content is, the better, the better it is for you. All right, so that's EAT. Let's go on from schema as a great bridge into the technical SEO elements here. All right, so, so expertise, authority, and trust is kind of the overarching umbrella. Google wants to return sites that have an expertise, an authority, and a trust. Part of that trust is established through the technical side of this. All right, so what is Google looking for? Well, they're looking for sites that are fast, that are secure, that are mobile friendly, and that are stable. Yes, well into the 60% of page uh, of, of websites visitors are looking at it on a mobile device. Google indexes mobile first now. It's thinking mobile first. I challenge you again, if you haven't done it yet, get your whole staff to look at your site on a mobile device for an entire week. Don't look at it on your desktop or your laptop. Have your whole staff use your site on a mobile device for an entire week and you will be very surprised what you discover. Um, if your site's not using SSL, if it doesn't have the HTTPS in it, gosh, that's a no-brainer. You absolutely should be that now. Um, it has to be fast, and we're going to talk about that here. It also be stable. So we've all seen sites, and, and I'm sorry, I'm looking at you, uh, New York Post. Um, when you go to that site, and as you're trying to read the content, things keep shifting. They move, they're moving all over the place or things pop up and things shift. It's like drives you nuts. That's an unstable site, something called cumulative layout shift, CLS. That's a bad thing. Um, so again, are, is any one of these things going to kill your SEO or double your search engine traffic overnight? No, but these are all the things you got to do. So let's talk about something that Google calls core web vitals. Core Web Vitals is basically what they're replacing speed with. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a few, a few ways to, to measure Core Web Vitals. So number one, uh, in Google Search Console, I, I don't have time today to go deep into Google Search Console, but every one of you out there should have a Google Search Console account set up for your brand. Uh, it's, this, is, this is your insight into how Google sees your site from a search perspective over here, right? Um, but if you look down here, there actually is a whole core web vitals section in Google Search Console. And it's gonna show you, hey, this is your performance on mobile, this is your performance on desktop. These guys are crushing it. They're doing really good on desktop. They're doing really good on mobile. They got, a, they got some URLs that quote unquote need improvement. Uh, but on mobile, and especially since Google measures this on a 3G 
connection, not even a 4G or a 5G connection, a 3G connection. Um, this is stellar, especially for a publisher who's trying to get a bunch of um, other ads and other things on the site and tagging that they're doing. This is this is stellar. So you can see there's some things that need improvement on here. Um, I'm not even gonna bother with this report. They're, they're just crushing it here. But I'm gonna go into this one here and we can see, okay, let's look at the ones that need improvement. And again, this isn't saying it's bad. It's just saying, yeah, you could even do a little bit better if you want. Um, so there's two things here. And this, these are, are two of the core web vitals that, uh, that Google measures. One is what's called CLS, cumulative layout shift. That's when, again, on mobile, especially as you're sitting there and you're trying to look at a, an article, as, it's, as the page loads, it starts shifting things down, right? This ad loads, shifts the content down. Whenever it's moving stuff around on the site and shifting stuff around the site as it's loading in, that's cumulative layout shift. That's bad user experience. And so Google gives you some negative points for that overall. Um, LCP, largest contentful paint. Ah, gosh, I love these terms that the engineers come up with. That's just saying, hey, the biggest piece of content, which is typically the article itself, the content, how long does it take for that to paint to the screen so that someone can actually read it, right? That's called largest contentful paint. Bottom line, these guys are crushing it. I mean, to have zero issues, zero poor for a publisher website is huge. I would challenge us all to do that. So check out Google Search Console. Um, there's another thing out here. There's um, this uh, web de web dot dev, which is kind of backed by Google. You could put in a site here, right? So if we do that same site, uh, tnation.com, and let's uh, run the audit. On that particular site so this is a public site you can go out there you can measure the core web vitals of any site on the internet with this out there um, that's another great place to kind of check for this there's other ways to do it there's a an extension you can put in google chrome for lighthouse but you can see here it says hey okay hey overall performance um it says it was redirected redirected to, to that okay i should have put the backslash on there but saying hey overall things are okay um you know your largest contentful paint you could use some help out you got some cumulative layout shift so it just it kind of tells you all the things you could do i'm not going to go into all this detail bottom line what google's trying to do is make sure is your site fast is it you know I, google doesn't want to send people to slow websites does it work great on mobile right does it um you know how does it move all over the place as it's loading up so all these things are getting into the core web vitals so go check it out go into google search console look at core web vitals look at page experience look at mobile usability right i mean got one little error i mean come on this is awesome um these guys are really really crushing it here um so check all this out you can see how that works or you could go use the public facing this uh this is at the web.dev slash measure so again these will all be links we will put up when we post this recording all right so that's the core web vitals let's talk about search engine sitemaps again i'm not going to go real deep into this thing but um if you're on wordpress uh, it's really easy. Um, you can build this using uh, a search engine optimization tool like Yoast SEO or Rank Math. Uh, those are great little plugins you can do. Other sites, you may have to build your own search engine sitemaps through whatever mechanism your content management system has. But let me show you a little bit about what a, a search engine sitemap looks like here. So let me go here to, let me just go to iztimes.com. Uh, slash sitemap, I think it's underscore index.xml. So here's an example of a search engine sitemap. Uh, take a second for it to come up. This is actually uh, created by Yoast. I'm hoping it's going to come up here. Um, but this is created by, by Yoast. Let me get a different site here. My connection may be a little slow right now. Let's look at tnation.com slash sitemapindex.xml oh yeah here it comes here's biz times so this is this is like an overarching sitemap it's an index to all the other sitemaps because you can only have so many um um 
uh, pieces of content per sitemap. So bottom line, you get into one of these and if you look inside one of these, uh, it's then going to show you all of the um, the individual pieces of content. Bottom line, I don't want to get too nuts with this. What this does is you're basically publishing. It's like an index, right? The back of index, the back of the book. You're publishing an index, telling Google, "Hey, here's all the pages on my site. Right? Here's all the pages. Here's all the posts. Here's all the categories. Here's all the authors. Here's all the tags." And then you can submit this directly to Google. So you submit it directly to Google and actually you can see right here, if I go to sitemaps, ah, there's this sitemap. You can see it was last read today, February 14th. This is just a great way to notify Google about new content on your site, right? You could wait for Google to come to you, but this is a great way to notify Google of new site, of new content on your site. Um, that's a search engine sitemap. By the way, you can also submit this to Bing Webmaster Tools. I know Bing, uh, it still has some decent traffic out there. So I like to submit to both uh, Google Search Console and Bing Webmaster Tools, but that's a search engine sitemap. And that's what that does. Um, the other thing you wanna look for, duplicate content. I see a lot of duplicate content sometimes where you've got um, perhaps two different URL structures that are out there and Google's looking at it's going, ah, which is the original one, which is what's called the canonical or the official, if you would, uh, page and which is kind of a, 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 an alternate URL for that page. You wanna fix all those things. Broken links on your site. You wanna definitely fix all those and get, and get those uh, nailed down. Um, inbound links, outbound links, just, just try, to, try to keep your broken links cleaned up. That will certainly help. This is a big one for site speed. Resize and compress your images. Um, I don't have a great example of this, but uh, uh, on hand, but I've been to some sites and like on their homepage, they may have a little thumbnail for uh, one of their articles that they're doing. And when I right click on the image and open it in full tab, it bumps up and it's like 6,000 pixels wide by 3,000 pixels tall. And it's this huge, image that's multiple megabytes in size. That's the worst thing to slow down your site. Um, those, si those images should actually be, and if you're using the right theme, it'll automatically do this. Those images should automatically be resized, re-rendered to the right native size you're gonna use it on your site in that thumbnail, and then automatically optimize. So that whole resizing, compressing image that's a huge, 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 huge issue that can really speed up your site for users and improve your load scores and your core web vitals for, for Google. Uh, last little thing, there's a little thing called robots.txt. So I will give you an example of what one of those looks like. I'm gonna go to tnation.com slash robots.txt. This is just a little thing that says, uh, whoops, may not be in there because uh, I put robot. Robots. There we go. So this is a, I'm going to bump up in size a little bit. This is a robots.txt file. This is a little, a special file that you can use to tell all these search engine spiders, robots, um, what to do, what not to do on your site, basically. I won't get too technical with it. Um, but sometimes if there's a search engine problem, something's gotten messed up with this. So we want to look at this and check this out. Um, in this case, uh, T Nation is doing a really smart move here. Um, uh, they're actually including the link to their search engine sitemap in the robots.txt. You don't have to do that, but it's actually considered sometimes uh, best best practice to, to do that. So uh, that's robots.txt. I don't want to bring this out too deep other than the, to say that, um, you know, that's one of the things we look at if there's some problems going on here. So all this technical crap. Let's talk about on page SEO, right? So this is what you do on the actual page itself. This is kind of content SEO. So we have the technical SEO. Here's the content SEO. Uh, so the on-page SEO. Again, if you're on WordPress, one of my reasons I love WordPress as a content management system, um, there's some great plugins out there to help you with this. Yoast SEO and Rank Math are my two favorites out there. Um, and they'll literally give you checklists. Now, they're just guidelines. You don't have to follow all of them. They're, 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 they're checklists. But what are some of the things that kind of helps you do? It helps your editorial staff or your production staff. You're going through, checking it out, make sure it works. Um, so here's the basic concept. Every single article has a key phrase. 
right? Every single article is has a subject. It's about something. So make sure you know what that key phrase is for every single one of the articles you're going to write about. Um, Google Trends can help you pick the right words, right? So I've been out here, I use this for all different kinds of things uh, on, on Google Trends, right? So if I were to come out here and if I were to say, you know, sometimes there's, there's, there's things that we may call something that no one else calls it. Um, so like, you know, if it was a, um, Oh, I can't come up with a good example right now, but I, I remember when I was working for a knitting publication, we put in a specific knitting term and uh, it, when we put in the actual real term, I uh, put in different terms around it, that's not what people call it. That's what we call it inside the industry, but that's not what people call it. So for instance, uh, if I were to do, uh, I should have thought of a good example of this beforehand. I'm drawing a blank right now, but let's say if I were to do like uh, Apple, Apple, um, Apple Maps. Let's just put an Apple Maps here. All right. So Google uh, Search Con Google Trends is a great tool that you guys can use to see. Okay, how many people are searching for this, and what's the volume of people searching for this, right? And then I can compare it. Um, you know, maps on Apple. That's a dumb comparison, but you can see, hey, very few, you know, there's a lot more people searching for Apple Maps than maps on Apple, right? Or you could call, say, is it iPhone Maps, maybe? Ah, interestingly, actually more people searching for iPhone Maps than maps on Apple. So if I'm gonna do an article on Apple Maps, I probably would use actual Apple Maps as the term. And you can uh, set it to a specific geographic region, specific term, whatever you want to do. Um, you can look at, hey, what about people are searching for news or for image or you know, what are they searching? This is a great way to get real world data on what people are actually looking for in your market rather than what we think it should be called. So we use Google Trends to help us pick a right the right words for the for the subject, the key phrase of this article. Then we want to use that key phrase. We want to use it in the title. We want to use it in the URL. We want to use it in the meta description. We want to use it throughout the content. We want to use it in some subheaders, H2s. We want to use it in the alt text of images or the captions of images. Now, we don't want to overuse it, right? We don't want to go too nuts talking about, you know, too much key phrase density, but we don't go too little either. So think about this. Every one of your articles, what is it that you're that this is about? And then you want to optimize for that. I know so many um, um, publishers who don't do this. Um, actually, this is gonna be one of our first. Uh, I'm gonna spill the beans here. Um, by the end of March, we're going to be launching some online courses. One of those courses is going to be search engine optimization for editors, where we're going to actually go through and teach uh, as an editor, as you're publishing, as your editorial staff, as you're publishing content, these are the things that you should be looking for to give your content the best shot to rank when someone's searching for that uh, in a Google search. Um, consider an outbound link uh, uh, from your site. Yes, an outbound link with a do follow behind it. Uh, do follow, you can indicate certain links, but indicate that. Uh, and that outbound link gives Google context, right? It doesn't hurt your ranking. It actually gives Google context. You know, for an Apple Maps, if I'm actually linking to Apple Maps Connect website, okay, it's saying, oh, this page is linking to that site. It, this page is more likely to, to be about Apple Maps because it's putting my article in context. Uh, and then considering inbound links to what are called cornerstone content. Now, I'm not going to dive deep into that today, but this is like a page in your site that's kind of the definitive page about that particular topic. And, you know, anything you're writing that's kind of about that, that dives into little nuances about that, um, you always want to refer back to that page on your site. That referring back tells Google this page is really important and will help boost that. But I'm not going to go too deep into cornerstone content today. All right, let's talk about inbound links. Um, I know our time's getting a little short here. This is, I told you it's gonna be a long session today. Um, inbound links to the page count, right? Think of inbound links in, in a way, uh, the more inbound links you have to uh, a page on your site, the more votes 
it's kind of getting now the whole concept of page authority domain authority is beginning to wane a little um but the idea here is still the more people are linking to your site the more authority um the more valuable people are finding that that site it also applies to your site so it's not just the inbound links to the page but what are the total inbound links to your site so again i'm going to bring up a little something here um Let's go out to, let's go to T Nation here again. I'm going to bring up this little bar here. So I use um, something called Moz. Uh, Moz is a, just a great little tool. You can go to moz.com. You, you can get this tool. There's, they have a little browser plugin. And uh, you can see up here, it's just a great little tool that I use to sometimes look at sites. You can see this has a page authority of 60. This is the home page. Um, now, these authority numbers, these are not Google numbers. These are Moz's proprietary numbers, so don't get too nuts with them. Uh, and a domain authority of 67, right? So the higher domain authority, the more authoritative your site, right? If I go out to like Google, um, right? Like here's, here's um, Google Search Console, right? It has a domain authority of 95, you know, almost as high as you can get. So there's an, an example, but this has a domain authority of 67, meaning they have over 20, almost 24,555 root domains with over 4.1 million links to the site as a whole. This homepage has 3,400 root domains that are linking to it with a total of almost 99,000 links, right? That, this is something that you can tell um, kind of how well your page is ranking, how well your overall site is ranking. Now, you can't necessarily control that, um, but let's talk about those links. Number one, create good content. Create content that people want to share. Now look, you're not gonna get 98,000 inbound links on a very uh, targeted B2B or really niche consumer topic, but in your market, do you have more links in on that particular topic? So create content that people actually want to share. This is go back to get rid of that junk, thin content. Get rid of that stuff. Create really good content that covers that topic that people want to share. Make it easy for people to share or link to your content. So I'll show you that a great example here. This is Local Marketing Institute. Um, they did a great job here of having a floating share bar, right? So if you're looking at this here, uh, it also it always floats. Uh, again, you go back to this site, they posted it here. Um, I like that the floating share is nice. Sometimes it doesn't work with your layout. It can interfere with other things you're doing. Um, I'm gonna show you this on mobile. If you look at it on mobile, I believe they have a floating share bar here on mobile. They don't have a floating share bar on mobile, but um, they do have a floating share bar here on desktop, for example. But either way, make it easy for people to uh, to share and link to your content. Um, I want to make a little something about something called toxic links. I don't want to make a huge deal of this because it's not as important as people make it out to be. Um, this has gotten really popular with a tool out there called SEMrush. So I'll show you SEMrush. This is not a tool I like to use. By the way, I'm showing you all the tools. Um, if you ever have a company call you up and say, your site isn't ranking well search, look at all these things you can do. I'll tell you what they're doing. They're using one of these tools I'm showing you here and they're running a report and they're gonna send it to you saying, hey, you suck, we can help you. But in reality, it's all this stuff that they're pulling just these automated reports, it's only a small piece what really goes into SEO. So if you ever get those kinds of reports or get those kind of calls or people are emailing you saying, hey, we can help you improve the SEO, that's fine. Look at it, take it with a grain of salt because there's also some things as publishers that we are making trade-offs for where our SEO may not be as good as it needs to be, but it's what we need for the business purposes. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, SEMrush is another great tool uh, for looking at search engines. One of their reports is what's called this backlink audit, and it'll show you kind of toxic links. So for this particular one, they're saying, hey, you have 4,156 referring domains to you. Uh, however, you've got 239 of those are toxic, right? And these are, now what are toxic links? Toxic links are basically um, links from junk sites links from junk sites and i won't get too deep into this but there's a gosh you'd be blown away by the amount of 
kind of black hat SEO stuff and link schemes and all this stuff is out there designed to fool Google's algorithms so that some shady player ranks higher in Google's algorithms. Um, but you can go through here and every once in a while, we'll go through here, we'll remove some of these um, backlinks to what's called a disavow. Google has an actual disavow tool. But like um, this one here, wiregram.it, right? They're linking to loss prevention. What is this? Well, they literally just brought in this particular image. So they're just linking to this image here, um, right? What does this look like here? Um, the VMC diagrams. It's just a junk page. It doesn't even exist. So we'll go through these and every once in a while we will begin to block these. You can see it has a high toxicity score. You got to be careful though. You get too crazy with this and it could begin to, you could begin to start kind of cutting to the bone and actually removing sites that are legit that actually can help you with your links. So don't get too nuts with, with uh, trying to clean up all the toxic links that SEM Rush says. Now I have seen some sites improve their search engine visibility once they get rid of all these toxic links. Why? You get too many of this stuff coming in here. Or if you have like a, I've seen some sites that have like forums where they, they weren't good in managing their forums or their user comments. And so there were a bunch of spam comments and a bunch of spam posts. Google begins to say, hey, you know, are you part of a link scheme? And they begin to ding you. Uh, I've only seen that happen once or twice where actually removing toxic links winds up helping somebody. But I want to bring that out here since we're talking about inbound links. Not all links are good. There are some bad links. Keep an eye on those. Some of those you may want to remove. Some of those you may not need to. Uh, so don't get too nuts with that. All right. That's the links. And then last but not least, I want to reemphasize Google News. Um, we talked about Google Publisher Center in a couple sessions ago, so I'm not going to go over that here today, but make sure any publisher should have a Google Publisher Center account and try to get yourselves listed in Google News and in Google Discover. If I go back out here, um, you can see that even though there's some good search results out here, they're also being found in Google Discover. And they're also being found in Google News. Um, for some publishers, being seen in Google News uh, and Google Discover generates almost as much traffic as in regular Google search. So that's it. I know we went a little long today. That was my publisher search engine optimization 101. Hope you guys found this helpful. And uh, we will see you next week. Unless you guys have any questions. If you guys have any questions, pop those into the chat right here, right now. We'll try to capture some of them. I know I went long here today. Danielle, you're welcome. Thanks, gang. We will see you. Uh, how's the weather? <laughs> Weather's sunny and 50 degrees here, Dan. <laughs> Thanks for joining. All right, gang. That's all for today. Hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the week. Cheers.